Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Ruth, welcome to the show. Thank you. So where where are you, where are you from? I'm from Sudbury, Ontario. Ontario? Were you born and raised there? I I was, yeah, in Walden, which is a little bit outside of the Sudbury area, but is since a part of the Sudbury area. Uh, that That's pretty cool. I have no idea what that area is. I just know the word Toronto, but I don't even know what that is. <laughs> uh, Four hours north of Toronto. Oh, 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 whoa, okay. Ooh, I just got to chill up my back. <laughs> uh, well, that's cool. Now, I hear some, you have a bunch of little friends around you. Uh, just in case anyone's wondering what that those little uh, peeping sounds are, what, what, what friends do you have uh, near you? Well, this weekend we picked up some little chicks, uh, some Chanticleers and some Icelandic. Now, by little chicks, you mean uh, you're not in the human trafficking business. You're actually like... <laughs> No, the red light doesn't mean that <laughs> anything other than a heat lamp. <laughs> okay. And they're away. <laughs> uh, so you got little chickens, huh? Yes. That's awesome. Yes. I, was, I was looking at some of your pictures. My dad raises birds, and so he okay. has chickens and pigeons and uh, beautiful pheasants and quails and all kinds of uh, birds and ducks and whatnot. And uh, so... Uh, uh, when I was looking through some of your photos, I was like, I know what those are. <laughs> <laughs> they're but, nice when they're little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're so cute. <laughs> Although I remember this one time I went into the one barn and uh, I had to go feed the little the little uh, chicks. And, um, and because of the environment, uh, he has rats. And they may not be huge rats, but just that the word rat freaks me out yeah. and so I open up the door and I go to scoop out some feed and a, a rat comes out of the bag and, and he's like totally calm around it he's like oh, no, no, it's just nature you know I'm like no it's not <laughs> not the nice kind of nature <laughs> <laughs> those are tiny hells of hell what I mean hounds of hell yeah. um <laughs> you, you did nature does teach you though that that's just it's common right it's common nature yeah, yeah. And it, what's weird is the rat isn't the scary part. What's scary, and I find this true in almost every aspect of life, is the overactive imagination. Yes. You know, so you see one running uh, along the top, and it's not, you know, like the top of the, the barn or whatever. It's not that it's running, because the reality is it's actually running from you. But the imagination, you're, yeah, at least in my imagination, I'm imagining this thing is just kind of getting in a better position where I can't see it just for it to leap onto my neck and gnaw my, my spine out yes. um, <laughs> and leave me paralyzed to die in the woods. Um, <laughs> be fed on by chickens and rabbits. You have a good imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. <laughs> in, a, in a safe place, it's wonderful. In a, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in the woods, it's scary. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so were you born and raised on a farm? I mean, did you like grow up your whole life on a farm? No, we lived in a, a developed rural area, mm -hmm. which was very much in, in the country, like in the woods, but little subdivisions they place everywhere then. Mm -hmm. um, we, where I live now was my grandparents' a farm where my father was born and raised. Oh, and wow. My, my great-grandfather was the first one in our family to own it back in 1925, I guess. And uh, I grew up coming here. on mm -hmm. the And so I know the property well, but I'm experiencing, experiencing that in a new way. 
Indeed. As an adult. Exactly, yeah. which means rather than being fun great grandpa's farm, now it's responsibilities and uh, duties and work. <laughs> and after the fact, because there's been nobody in like probably, well, a long time who's really farmed it or, you know, so everything grows up wild in no time at all. So, wow. yeah, it's recovering it, I guess you could say. It's what an artist does, I guess. Sure. Yeah, it's the greatest project of all. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I want to farm one day. Um, I, I dream of, I always said by the time my, my son's 12, he's seven. So I got five more years to, uh, well, actually four, he'll turn eight in a couple months, um, to acquire one. But I, I, uh, want a farm with some outbuildings yes. and, uh, I used to call them outhouses, but then I was like, well, <laughs> wrong word, wrong word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with some outbuildings that, um, my daughter, who, who's 10 now, um, I call her my architect, my designer, and, and my son's my builder. And our old carpenter, um, I, I, I promised him, probably when my son was born, I said, Ray, you know, his dad taught him how to be a carpenter, and then he was my carpenter. And, um, and when we had our house, uh, I'd draw designs, and we would figure it out, and, and, and he would make it, you know? And, uh, and I said, you know, none of your sons took you up on, um, on your skill. So when my son turns uh, 11, 12 years old, uh, he will become your apprentice. So you have to stay alive until then. Um, <laughs> Yay. And, That's awesome. Yeah, and so I would love to work with my daughter on designing spaces and then having Ray and my son um, and myself get out there and actually build those spaces right. um, in their early years. And uh, and then ultimately building it into a, a wonderful artist retreat community type of experience, so we could open it up mm. once or twice a year and 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 have uh, you know the annual Vargas Farm Art Farm nice. Extravaganza, whatever I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's really cool. I, I that's cool. We just have to make it a rat-free farm somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've ever seen one though, but I know there are yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Oh, we just have a lot of cats running around. Yes. So, um, Ruth, what are you currently working on in your studio? Well, it's it's different than what I'm used to, but it is um, a chair for um, it's an anirandak chair or a ah, chair. Yes, yes, yes. It's for a children's charity called um, the Manitoulin Children's Foundation, who raises money through auctioning these chairs to send uh, unfortunate or underprivileged children to camp, from mm. my understanding. <laughs> uh, I've never done this before. I was just invited to do it, so I was uh, excited to get started on something like that. So I'm, it's proving to have its challenges, mm -hmm. but I think that's really good. I like that. Um, and and what are you painting on it? Um, I'm painting sunflowers on it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Backlit sunflowers. Oh, shoot. Very, you're really good at that whole backlit thing. Um, or at least uh, I should say, yeah, I would say backlit. Um, I saw some of your paintings and the one, you have one really prominent one in it and it's just kind of cool how the light hits the snow in it and makes it glow, but it also, if I'm correct in saying it, it's kind of backlit as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that nice little, um, oh, I forget what they call it, a uh, rim light, I guess, um, on, on the snow and I believe the trees. I, I'm not looking at it right now. I'm just trying to remember it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's cool. So um, do, do you paint sunflowers often or is this like a first time? No, years ago I would paint sunflowers when I used to do more of a folk art application. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I would do it that way. But I didn't want to go back to that. So I had to rediscover acrylic painting um, with sort of the grayscale um, underpainting and then yep. doing washes, applying washes on top of that. And mm -hmm. I really do like the effect of it. It's... I, I generally work with oils, but I've wanted to try a medium that's um, 
acts like oil or has the effect of oils, but doesn't take as long. Yeah. And I think that something new is opening up through this opportunity for me. That's awesome. Now, what, what benefits are you finding from working in your uh, grayscale first? And then, then of course, glazing your colors on top, but like what, what, what's the one or two really strong benefits of doing that grayscale painting first? Yes. Well, I, I tend to like to work for a long time on my pieces and mm -hmm. uh, oils do take a, a bit of time. And because I, I do tend to still do, I, I still um, build layers, even mm -hmm. in my oil painting. Um, I find I can do it immediately with the acrylics, whereas with the oils, it just gets very muddy and, you know, you just have to respect the drying time with the oils. So, so you can move quicker. Yes, and also blending, if I was going to do acrylics like I did oils, blending was always going to be an issue. So I couldn't get the effect that I wanted with the grayscale um, mm -hmm. without getting it. Um, yeah, you, I just couldn't see how it could be done without a lot of dry brushing. I just didn't like the effect of it. So mm -hmm. I find that this way I can, I can continue to build layers and bring my values darker. Um, I can do just um, the underpainting and then I can even with my glazes push that down further if I feel it's not enough. Mm -hmm. I can't bring it lighter though. I can only bring it darker. So that is tricky, but I'm learning and I know there's solutions to the problems because many of people have, you know, done that before me. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a journey. That's cool. And, and how long have you been uh, in, involved in that? Like doing it that way? Just this chair. Oh, just on this chair you're working in the grayscales? Yes, because oh, okay. it's, uh, I don't have enough time to finish the chair before the deadline <laughs> yeah. if I was to use oils. So Indeed. I had to find another way um, with the acrylic that I was satisfied with. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I like doing it that way too, working with the grayscale first and then glazing those. Um, when, when I used to use acrylics, uh, it, it, I, it's weird. Like I like oil, um, but I got really, really sick once with oil. And so I kind of don't go there very often. Mm -hmm. um, and so the acrylics I really liked. Um, and it was really weird. Like when I used to use watercolor, I would make them look like acrylics. And then when I would use acrylics, it would look like oil paint. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and it was like, huh, this is kind of cool. Um, but with the grayscale, it, that's really important. I, I know when I'm working with my students, I give them a, a system that I was trained in on how to actually pre-plan every value in your composition, you know, yes. and then, and so you have all those things worked out before ever mixing paint, and then you just apply your grayscales, your grayscale, mm -hmm. um, that, that underpainting basically, and then yes. you can come back and, you know, glaze on top and, and I think that was, if I can interject, that's mm -hmm. what the problem I had was when I work in my oil, I pre-mix all of my values ahead of time. Yep. Um, and there, I don't leave a lot of room for guesswork as far as uh, I want to be sure that I have that shift in value. Mm -hmm. And with the acrylics, because they dry so quickly, I was, I'm, I'm not able to pre-mix because they change their color or their value when they dry. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard for me to see that shift in value when the, when the paints are wet. Mm. So this way I can have that dynamic effect from, of contrast from dark to, to lights, from warms to cools. And I'm mm -hmm. in control of that right on top of what's already there. So I think it's a fantastic way to work. Awesome. Awesome. That's brilliant. Um, one, one thing you can do to help you um, when doing the color, especially with the oil, um, it, let's say like I use a, a nine system, uh, a nine system, a, a gray scale system. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so one thing you could do is actually like, just get, like take one value that, you know, let's say the nine values from uh, white to black and fill an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with just that value and then go print it out on a laser printer. And, then you can lay them underneath a piece of glass. And that way, when you're mixing your color, mm -hmm. you're actually mixing it on that value. Oh, that's interesting. 
And so it's very, it just allows you to control your color to match that value very, very quickly. So you're meaning almost like if you're putting, you have a glass palette and you have that value underneath your palette, that when you're mixing it, it's transparent to the point that you can see. Yeah, because if you mix color, if you mix color, uh, two colors together that are the same value, if you squint your eyes just at slight, they should blend together. So ultimately, it looks like a gray that either may be cool or red or, or purple or warm or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it's going to shift, but the values, if they're the same, like the eye, it's very hard for the eye to tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes more of a feeling that you have two different colors, but what you're actually seeing seems very similar. And so if you're mixing, let's say, a 50% a, a gray, and you put it on that 50%, um, when I say gray, I mean a color, right? Mm -hmm. And you put it on that 50% yeah, yeah. gray, mm -hmm. it should fade away. Where if you put it on, let's say, a 60% gray, um, it should, the color will look lighter and, because the background's darker, right? That's true. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of times people will, will mix color on a white background, mm -hmm. which then ultimately makes all their colors darker that's true that's you know because just yeah mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> usually we put a neutral uh, fabric or work on a wood surface that's neutral uh, mm. with, my, with my glass palette for that reason nice yeah nice but I find that that would be a very long process for me more or less what I do is I would print out my reference in a black and white mm -hmm. and then I would literally paint it in black and white and then I would go on with my washes. So it's really up to my eye to decide what value that is. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I'm shifting through it. But with oils, it's very different. I actually mix the actual color under glass so that I get, I get that value shift going through with the colors. And I don't even, I don't think about the scale. But I know that mm. I'm going one step lighter every time. Mm -hmm. So I know that maybe there's 10 or 12 different values there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll work in a warm and a cool uh, in order to, you know, bring it out. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah you do uh, really good value work. Um, was, Thank you. was that something that you, you learned at an early age? Hmm. Well, no, I, I first started um, in folk art. Okay. So there's only really, there's only really two or three choices there. You, you go with your medium tone and you highlight or you, and you bring down shadows. Uh, I never understood anything at all um, until I got into uh, oil painting. And then I, t I took a class and I still didn't understand color mixing because they were working from pre-mixed tubes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand temperature. I didn't understand anything. And, and I'm the kind of person that I have to understand it or I can't do it. I can't just copy what someone else does. It drives me crazy to try to figure out what they're doing. Um, so I had to really understand light and value and temperatures. And I had um, happened upon a course, and I think it's uh, kind of uh, providential in a sense, because I was really ready for that teaching about color theory and uh, and uh, understanding value shifts and mm. stuff like that. But I understood it because um, the trade that I had was uh, hairstyling. And no, you really? have to learn your color theory in that in order to do hair coloring. So sure. it made a lot of sense to me, but I'd never really understood that in an artistic um, perspective, you know, on mm. canvas, say. Mm -hmm. So then when I understood that, well, you're going to use the complementary to cancel out or to, um, you know, to enhance value or to, to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Then that really, um, from there, I felt like, wow, I'm, I'm ready to go until I had my next paradigm shift. And then I realized, oh, yeah, that's just the beginning of, of the wonder. You know, there's so much <laughs> more that comes into it. So, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of those paradigm shifts along the way. So that was my beginning in oil that I, I could represent uh, and duplicate a, a photo perfectly, like mm -hmm. with what I understood. But, um, yeah, and, and then I had to learn more about composition and light and, and uh, 
temperatures and things like that. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, what was the name of the color course that you found? Actually, it wasn't a color course. It was, um, his name was Mark Carter. Okay. He's a very well known, um, I guess, artist, portrait artist. And uh, he had put out a video course. This is back in probably 2007, maybe. I'm, I'm not remembering <laughs> exactly. But he realized that, um, and he, he had a formula for a medium that works really good to slow dry to keep things open. Mm. So you could really work it as a new artist because we tend to overwork things when we're new artists. Mm -hmm. And um, it ended up that he couldn't ship his product because it was too volatile, I guess. And uh, so he's reworked his entire program to something different now. But, and I, I mean, I don't continue following him. I've, I, I've watched him throughout the years uh, and how he's changed to adapt to what he's doing. And mm -hmm. um, but from, from what he taught me, just the color mixing was profound to me. It was working with a limited palette. And that was the key to, uh, to understand at least how to get what I wanted without any guesswork. Because I didn't mm -hmm. like sitting back from a painting and going, why does it not look right? Mm-hmm. But when I understood, believe me, I was really ignorant about it. Um, when I understood a white bowl or a white kettle is how he kind of sh showed it, was not white at all. Nope. <laughs> I was freaking out. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's I'm on not drugs. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no white in it. So that was, that was really exciting for me. I know it seems simple, but it just, it really, I really saw it as, as how we see life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I I think a white kettle. Okay, let's paint it white, right? It's white, but no, I did. I wasn't seeing. He taught me how to see, hmm. and uh, and that meant so much to me. And my I wouldn't be the artist that I am today if I didn't have that uh, fundamental teaching at the beginning. That's uh, I like the way you said that they taught you how to see. Yes, and because it's really really what 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 a great teacher does is to teach you how to see and yes. they figure out ways to do that um and then with that it's it's specifically in this case let's say to see color right or to see value yes. um because as an artist there's all kinds of things that we have to learn how to see yes and um so that's really cool that's really really cool but uh, what, what are you currently learning to see? Hmm. Well, um, the painting you mentioned, The Evening Light, that mm -hmm. was at a time when I w my paradigm shifted again. Hmm. Uh, and I had been with a, uh, an artist club uh, mm -hmm. at the time where there was uh, a gentleman who teaches art classes. And um, he was, every time I'd bring a painting in, he would sort of ask me where the light and uh, was coming from, and I didn't really understand what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, he was saying, well, you have to have one light source, and you have to consider that when you're, when you're building up your painting, you know? And I, I went on for probably about a year like this, listening to him, then I thought I understood how to paint. And I did understand my technique in painting, but I didn't understand what makes a painting great. Hmm. And uh, I couldn't make it out to that uh, art club. I know um, it was every Saturday. And for that year in particular, uh, for many reasons, I couldn't get out to um, him trying to teach, you know, people how this works. So I, I started on YouTube and I watched videos um, about composition and light and how, um, how that strong light and drama and, and how important it is in bringing attention to certain areas of your work and how to make a painting great through your composition. And I, and again, it was another, like, it was another paradigm shift. I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize, I didn't think about that. So when I show my work on Facebook or anywhere else, I've shown my work from the beginning Mm -hmm. um, because I, I more or less, uh, I said to that gentleman afterwards, I said, you know, I realized all the work I did before now is no good. I said, I didn't understand, um, 
I didn't understand the light and the shadow. I, I just painted photographs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he didn't understand why I even said that. But I, uh, but I did that evening light painting. And that was my, I painted it in, in a dark atmosphere with that light coming up from behind. And I just a little bit of, of light highlighting on that snow just to, to lead your eye around. And I thought, mm-hmm. if, and no, I didn't follow the golden ratio where I didn't follow anything except I wanted the eye to go around the object and sort of in a Z design and then um, through on the left hand side. But I was still playing around with it and still, you know, I'm still a student of it mm-hmm. right now. I've only done maybe about four or five uh, artworks since then trying to think ahead of time, even when I'm taking my picture about my composition and where I'm going to want that person's eye to go and realizing that there's so much, I don't know if you can call it psychology or math behind it. That's exactly Um, what it is. Yeah. To make you go where I want you to go. Um, And yet still having that realism, which is not, it's not copying a picture, but it's, I want it to to be an experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I recently watched one of your posts on Facebook where you decoded the painting and I just flipped out. I was like, I can't believe that artists do that. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to make the waves go in and out. I want, I want the trees to sway. Like you just, once you realize the, the power that's behind the, the master's work, you, you think, wow, that's almost, um, it's almost alchemy. Like it's almost That's like exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I like the word you're using a lot. <laughs> Paradigm like, al- al- um, alchemy. Ah, yes. Yes. And so I've always considered myself a medium um, between the, the world that is somewhere we can't see to what I want to, to bring what I want to draw forward, right. To, for people to see in the way that I want them to see it. But I've never always, I've not always had the, the map that I need to, to find that. So mm-hmm. I think it was in another post that you put that, and you, you probably could quote it. I, I'm not good with quotes. But um, it said something like, it's a Chinese uh, proverb, that when the student is ready, that the teacher or the master shows up to teach them. Mm-hmm. So I think it was really neat because I did look into your program and I thought, that's what I need, actually. I want to understand that. I'll tell you, you know, I'm not going to go into a sales pitch here, but I will say this. Um, The words that you're using tells me that you have the mind and the soul that's ripe for that kind of information. Um, So, for example, a lot of artists will say, when they come to me, they'll say, yeah, you know, composition really means this to them. Uh, and design means, well, I'm leading the eye through a painting, right? Mm-hmm. And technically, they're correct. Mm-hmm. Where, where, where they fall short is technically, if I got in a car and I drove from New York and I, 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 I could be going to California because technically I'm moving, right? Yes. But without having... A purpose you could end up in Mexico not California or I could end up in Toronto um, and not California so that's the key the the element that's often missing it's not about moving the eye through a a image quote-unquote pleasingly Mm -hmm. it's about what is the psychology the experience or the feeling that you want that person to have and then you move the eye in such a way that it actually triggers that specific emotion so yes. if I so if I move the eyes up, that is a very optimistic experience for the human being. If I draw the eyes down, it's not an optimistic experience. Sure. It can be nostalgic. It could be um, you know d- depressive. It could be you know. And so depending on how the eye engages inside your rectangle is going to make you feel very very different. Mm-hmm. You know. It, 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 so it's a lot of psychology. It's also, you know, if you're interested in, in studying psychology in terms of sales. So, for example, like, um, like power structures, 
so for, um, oftentimes like, uh, you know, like in a church, right? You have a pulpit that's up higher than the congregation. Mm -hmm. Well, why? So we can see them better, <laughs> maybe, yeah. you know, but what it does is it puts you at a low, the congregation low, it puts the pastor high, it, it changes your eye direction so that you're gazing up as if you're a child looking up at a parent, right? Yes. Um, and so, so when you change that physical structure, let's say, let's say of a traditional, I don't know why I'm going in this direction, but let's say of a traditional church setting and you move that church into homes, into small groups. Well, now everybody's sitting on the same couch, the same eye level, and the relationships become far more dynamic because it's not this, I'm just a little child. You're the great, you know, teacher submitted to you type of experience. It's, oh, wow, we're all in this together. Right. Yes, it's more like fellowship. It's fellowship. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the richness grows. It's the same thing mm -hmm. with the painting. Like if you're forced, let's say if you do a portrait of someone and you shift it up a little bit so that the eye of the average user uh, viewer, I mean, has to look up. Well, now all of a sudden this, this painting has authority. It has, uh, um, you know, it, it's, we're submitted to it, mm -hmm. but if you lower it, and we look down on it. Well, now, now it's submitted to us, right? So, right. so then, so there's all these little things yes. that you can play with that become an experience for the viewer. And and to me, that's where it becomes very, very fun, like yes. figuring out all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I I like the word alchemy a lot, which ultimately means um, in the Arabic, Allah's chemistry, right? The chemistry of God. Um, and, and, and <laughs> um, which is really the story or in the imagination that transforms something. And so how is it that you can <clears throat> transform your, these materials, paint, canvas, which ultimately in itself has no value or very, very little value, mm -hmm. right? But when you infuse your imagination and personality and skills through them, mm -hmm. you're 100% right. There's an alchemy that occurs. And more importantly, there's an alchemy that occurs when the viewer engages with it, right? So the painting is not really important. What's important right. is the viewer, when they walk away, did you change them? Yes, that's right. right. Yes, that's what it's about. It's not, I realize it's not what I, it's not the subject of what I paint anymore. It's yeah. what it means to that. And what's what it means to me and what I want it to mean to somebody else. And that's the key is what is it that you want it to mean? Mm -hmm. Because I, yeah. I don't subscribe to the idea that art should just put, be put out there and people just interpret it as they want it to be interpreted. To me, that's yes. lazy. Um, it's kind of like building a highway and just saying, well, let's just build it and it ends where it ends. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> that makes no sense. You know? Yes. There was for nothing then. There's no purpose in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's purposeless, purposeless. And so when you, when you start talking about psychology and you start talking about math, um, a lot of people get confused with what is design and what is composition. Yes. And after 25 years of, studying this and, and playing with it and practicing and teaching it, I realized that design is the psychology or the storytelling or the grammar of your work. And composition is the math. It's the precision. It's the understanding how um, the mathematics of, of this space works and then working within it. And, if you want an extremely intelligent, highly intelligent piece, you need both. Yes, you need to respect um, yeah. how something um, come, uh, how to bring it out. Yeah. Because if it's one-sided, it just it's not as effective. And 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 the design really is what engages with the people, and then the composition that math gives it gives the piece itself this intrinsic value because it's it's just so well crafted and, and pulled together yes. um which then which then we feel you know it's i always tell people like 
when you jump, the amount of calculations that occur in the human mind or any animal, I, I, I realized in once I realized this by watching squirrels jump from trees to trees. And I'm like, the amount of science and yes. mathematics and physics and mm-hmm. I just everything, you know, like, um, like it if command, if commands mm-hmm. a deeper respect, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 the brain works so fast and we, and we, mm-hmm. and we get it. So when a painting is not composed properly on a subconscious level, our brain is calculating it and it can tell if it's off or not. I know. That's why I sit with a painting for about, a, you know, for however long it actually takes mm-hmm. after I'm done it. And like, well, after I, I'm, after I've got it to a point and then I let it talk to me. Mm. Um, and if it's, if it's not right, I, I'll feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, because I realized this early on years ago, I painted a chair, if I can give an example, mm. and it had a little, it had a little window with a very tiny little impressionistic painting of, of an ocean and some birds flying in. My husband came along and he said, Oh, wow. I feel like I'm looking through a little peephole and I can see a world out there. And he says, I can see it. I'm looking at, I'm like, there's, it's not what I, I was thinking how can you have a good imagination I thought the brain does is doing something so I don't really have to put all the information there yep that the brain will do it so I've played around with this with people for a long time at shows and knowing that if I get the values right and if I get my math right they'll see something more like they'll I've had perhaps people saying it feels like it's coming off the canvas but I know it's not coming off the canvas, but it's somehow it's the brain is doing that. It's making it happen for them. And I realize, wow, if I just, if I just respect the rules yep. and play the play within the game, the way it's supposed to play that the brain and the psychology will work. Yep. But uh, as you said, if you don't really know, you're kind of guessing at it. And, and that's, and I'm glad you said the rules. You know, yes. I, I was telling someone the other day, I, I was driving once and I saw the way the light came down and hit the mountain and the trees in this little house. And I was like, wow, that's beautiful. And I realized beauty is just being in awe of the government or the, or the, or the principles or the rules that exist that are not man-made. Yes. But that's it's right. something beyond us that made those rules that says yes. when light comes in here, a shadow forms, right? Yes. And, and, and so when I hear people say, oh, you know, well, I'm an artist, I'm here to break the rules. I, I, I kind of mm-hmm. chuckle because mm-hmm. you can go break man's rules, yes. but, but design is yes. not a man-made language. It's, yes. it's, it's something that something else made that language, that reality. And yeah. those rules can't be broken. That's right. There's and if an you order. break it, then the, then the art is broken. Exactly. If, there's an if order. There's, if there's not, if you don't respect that order, then you're going to know it when you're viewing it, that it's not been respected because I've done it many times where I've expanded a painting without my reference Mm -hmm. in particular. And when it was critiqued by that one individual, he he picked on those areas. And I thought it was interesting because I only just pulled it a little further, maybe an inch or two. And it's, it did not sink in with the rest of the work because it wasn't really there to begin with. Exactly. Now you could, you could stretch those and all those things exaggerate it, but you would have to do it from the beginning Mm -hmm. so that it, so it's not a mistake, but it was done deliberately. It's not everybody that can see it, but there's certain people who do see that can see it. Other people, they don't, they don't even think about it. And I think, well, that's good then, you know, I can get away with it somewhat, but I'd rather not have to do that. And, and, and knowing the rules, like if something like that occurs, like knowing the rules to make sure that there's enough there that brings satisf- uh, satisfaction, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that satisfying feeling. <laughs> yes. uh, it, it doesn't stop you. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So there just, there just has to be, um, so you have to know, you have to have that sensitivity to know what to exaggerate and focus on and what you can let go Mm -hmm. and um oh definitely as far as bringing something into focus and letting everything else sort of 
go go back like or mm -hmm. not as defined yep um and 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 i think i do that more i try and do that more with light now than i do with mm. with value um even temperature something cooler is less important than something warm it's just the way that we are mm -hmm. um so we're more drawn to that warmth so i'm just i don't know everything but i i'm learning and i I think intuitively, I, I, I'm still very intuitive. And so when I do a piece, I'll sit with it for a while. Like I just did a birch painting mm -hmm. and I wasn't happy with it because it wasn't very pretty to mm -hmm. me, but it respected the situation. Mm -hmm. And I, and I achieved what I had set out to achieve with it. And I, and I put a little bit of a bush in between the trees that was there in my reference and there was I couldn't figure out why am I even painting that there because it's not it's just in the shadow it's you probably wouldn't even really think about it but then I realized why I did it and it, I told my husband this it's because I wanted to go down the path and if I was to not put that there everybody would cheat and go through the trees Mm -hmm. And this way their, their eye has to come around that bush just as if they were walking. They wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to walk through there. That's so, brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. And yet it wasn't strong enough to say what it is. It's just, you don't even, I don't think you think about it. And I think people would say, why would you put that there? But now I know why I did. Yep. And so now next time you can be more deliberate and yeah. more intentional. Um, you know, Cezanne said, that we're painting sensations not that we are painting sensation but we're what we're actually doing is painting <laughs> yeah, sensations meaning, actually <laughs> oh, that's funny <laughs> and and when you focus on that and then you then you go into a person like nikola tesla who says if you want to understand the secrets of the universe begin to think in terms of energy frequency and vibration yes and uh, you like that right oh, um, i do i love that and so when you start to look at your artwork beyond representation and i'm not saying that you you let go of the representational skills and the realism skills mm -hmm. i'm saying with those skill sets yeah if you begin to focus on the vibrations the frequencies the sensations and the um, energy of the piece then in my yes. opinion you start creating artwork oh, at yeah, a exactly. very very high level yeah. and and, and and, and when you focus on that, all of a sudden, abstract art, folk art, mm -hmm. realism, uh, impressionism, all of them become 100% valid. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Uh, it's funny you say that because um, another one of my little paradigm shifts was uh, at the art club, I... So one of the other artists mentioned about Lauren Harris. I uh, was a member of the group of seven. Now he went to a show and hmm. I was, I didn't know who he was because I didn't study art at school. I, I just learned how to paint. I, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a huge difference in understanding. Uh, they're, they're, they're two different spectrums. So mm -hmm. um, when I went to study, like he looked at me like I had egg on my face because who would be an artist and not know who the group of seven is in Canada, right? <laughs> I, I took it upon myself to study their work. And initially when I st started as an artist, I saw their work and I thought, oh, it's, it's terrible. You know, it's just, it's, it's just messy and not defined. And as a realist artist, I, I really wanted to, to see more definition in the work. And I didn't understand different genres. I didn't oh, understand. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know. And I didn't know with plein air that they only have about seven minutes of light. It was only after I understood light and composition that I realized what they did. Yeah. And then I was, and then I was really excited about what they had done. And I thought, wow, they, they, <laughs> they managed to make an impression of the landscape in the uh, the light that they were in and in a short period of time and you know did that comp you know they were compositionally correct mm -hmm. so they had to think about this Heck yeah yeah and then and they bring it home in their studio no well, no photographs i don't think yep. 
and then they finished the work. So now when I look at it, I think, wow, it was all about the light. It was all about the composition. It wasn't about making it a picture or nope. a, a photo. Uh, it was just grabbing the essentials and, and putting them on a canvas and then looking at, okay, yeah, now, so when I, I go to those places, I think, oh, there's that light. There's that light that uh, Tom Thompson used in, in that painting. And, and, and there it is. It was, it was expressed. It was expressed. Yes. Yes. And so now with my work, um, the one the evening light that you saw that you took note of, I said to my husband, I'm so tired of high realism. Mm -hmm. I just want to respect the values and put the paint where it belongs. No blending at all in that painting, eh? Like on those trees. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> yeah, yeah, eh? <laughs> it's a Canadian thing. And, and so when I stood back from it, the further I got, I thought, there it is. My brain puts it all together. Yep. I'm not going to go in and mess with it because I know that it's exactly just the way it should be. And that's when I learned that, yeah, that's when the brain takes over and, and that the rules are evident that they, if you respect them, that it will, it will be profound to the viewer. And I did get that response. And, and that's exactly what you're looking for is that profound experience. And yes. I think that painting that we're talking about, the evening light does that. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. I think you have this beautiful blend between this folk art feel but when you look at it, you, you're like, oh, the girl's got skill, right? Um, and, and I think there's this really cool blend between the two where it's almost like a folk art spirit, yeah. but, but with a classic, um, classical art mind, if that makes sense. And I think it's still developing. So I, I, I never tell anybody I've ever arrived yet. I'm just a student and... There's just so much more to know before you could really define anything. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Like when yeah. I look through your work, I'm not, I don't really see a distinct style, but I do mm -hmm. see this, um, this hunger and you're constantly moving and growing to another yeah. depth and depth. And, you know, you might do that for the next, you know, 10, 15 years and that's okay. Yeah. You know, because, um, you know, I looked up this uh, Lawrence Harris and I love the work. Yes. I love it. Yes, me too. And yet and he changed his style. Sure. Yeah, he started like the group of seven and then he turned out, you know, doing something really different, just breaking apart and those values. And, and, and when you look at him and you read these images, right, yeah. you can almost hear him describing to you yeah, you know, it was like uh, almost like these very light value uh, triangles just, just yeah. pulling up out of the sky. And then behind it was this beautiful, soft, um, uh, white mass of snow. And, and you can almost hear him describing these landscapes without using very many nouns. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and it's like his soul was having an experience, a moment. Mm -hmm with the spirit of the the subject and what he captured was his way of articulating that experience not what his eyeball saw yes but that invisible uh dialogue with the muse and the muse was the environment it wasn't you know an apple and an orange on a table which is a muse in itself um and and also the muse, the relationship and the dance between the light and the snow and the warmth of the earth and the water and him and himself being present because we're looking yes. at it from his view. Mm -hmm. And being able to write this essay, choreograph this, this beautiful dance mm -hmm. in paint and pencil um, is... is it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. It's, you know, that's what it is. That's right. That's right. They took the rugged uh, Canadian landscape, which people would, would really probably, from what they were used to it over in Europe, would say, well, it's pretty, it's pretty raw, you know, undeveloped, untouched. And yet they expressed it in such a profound way that it attracted 
hundreds of thousands yes. of people to a country from everywhere in the world, yep. you know, and it, it, it branded, it branded the country. It trademarked our country. You know, it's kind of strange how in America, you know, we have a, a group of people who constantly want to tell Americans, and I include Canadians in this, that, you know, we hate nature and we're always trying to kill the planet and all this stuff. Yeah. And what I find very interesting is that a huge part of American culture is built off hundreds of years ago, this, this experience where people came to the new world yes. and what they saw was untouched land, which they didn't, were, were not used to because in Europe, you know, you had wars and all kinds of things and, you know, people conquering lands and taking it and this and that. And from my, I, I took this um, American painting course. Uh, it was an art history course, uh, back in college and it was probably I would probably say the, the best course I took uh, in all of college um, and it really was nature the artists and nature became um, they were saying that it was the new it was the new garden of Eden right that they they, yeah. they found this paradise yes and the artists like uh, Thomas Cole and and um, and uh, Frederick Church, and you know, and these kind of guys up in Canada, and you know, that's what they were doing. They, they were just—they called them like the pastors of this of this church, which yeah. was. But the way they they put out their the way they preached their gospel, which was this beautiful relationship between God, nature, and man, mm -hmm. um, and that we were to be in all of this experience was through their paintings and mm. um you know i think that's great yeah I think that would be probably how i would see myself as well that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah. uh tom is cool and, I, and i'll bring this up because it might be a technique that you might be interested in it might also give you insight in what these guys did uh thomas cole was the first american landscape paint american landscape painter um and I, when I say American, I guess I mean the colonies or whatever, not necessarily in Canada. Um, and he worked up in New York in the Catskills area. And what he would do is he would go out and he would take notes of the landscapes, the trees, this, and, and, and not just write, but I would assume, because I haven't seen his sketchbooks, I would assume that he would sketch, write, take notations, all this kind of stuff. And he would just go out like a researcher and gather information. And then he would go back to his studio and compose these very large paintings. And when people got in front of them, they said, oh, we're in the Catskills. Hmm. But, but you can never find that location in the Catskills because it didn't exist. Wow. But it, he was able to capture the spirit of the Catskills and yeah. people knew that that's where they were. Yeah. But it, it came out of his experience, out of his mind. And, um, and, and I just always found that very fascinating. Yes. So he like, took the integrity of the land yes. and he, he reproduced it so that it was so real that people believed it existed. And yet it's, it was something that was never actually seen by the human eye. Exactly. And yet it becomes a part of your history because it's, it's something people experienced early on as the landscape. Absolutely. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. I think the group of seven probably <laughs> did something similar to that. But, and yet you can trace quite a bit of where they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Lauren Harris, of course, like he, he changed, there was more psychology built into his work at the end where it was more spiritual, mm -hmm. spiritually applied. And yet we knew that the, the medium he was using was the landscape. Now but I'm looking expressing something through it, right? I'm looking at a picture of him. Was Lauren Harris like a light skinned black guy? No, I don't think so. Wow. White. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't, I haven't seen many pictures. I, I, every single picture I look at him, he looks like maybe his grandparents or maybe one of his parents might have been uh, dark skinned. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He's standing by these uh, 
two little old white people and he's like far darker than them. Well, he spent a lot of time outdoors. So you can imagine his pigment in his skin must have been pretty dark at times too, depending on what his, his heritage is. Yeah, don't, I don't think we think about it so much as Canadians because we're so used to that mixture and we really don't know all together who we are all the time. Huh. So in Canada, do you have like, what, what, like I never even thought of, this question has never popped into my head until this moment, but obviously we have this very interesting history with Africans down here. Um, and primarily because they were being shipped to the Caribbean islands and, and, and South America, but then they end up coming up here um, and through the South. But I never really even to me, like Canada was like, Oh, you're either white or you're like some Eskimo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, Well, maybe it used to be that way, but not anymore. So there's, there is like a large, like, I was going to say African-American population, but African-Canadian or maybe through France or something oh, like everywhere. Wow. That's it's, interesting. A, it's a multi-culture. It's you really most, I think probably a lot of people don't know Actually, where you know, their bloodlines run, but a lot of it is indigenous people are running through the, you know, a lot of the French, um, you know, but then there was, there's every culture that, that has come through. And so the Irish mixed with the native and, and, you know, so you have, Italians, you have everybody, you know, and it's interesting. Cool. So at the end, because we're now, what, 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 what I do find is that there's, there's places like Little Italy, or there's Chinatown, or there's, you know, you know, Little India, or whatever. And so usually they'll come to one area back in the day, I think. But now, mm -hmm. because once you're born Canadian, you know you just have all of these cultures mixing. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I think what Canada wants to do, I think the feeling and the spirit behind Canada is that we're all one. So we've all come together all as one and, and there's no identification between that, except um, we now have our own culture. We now have our own traditions mm -hmm. that we pulled in other people's traditions if we like them. Right. So it's, uh, it's very colorful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I think a lot of us are trying to find, well, where's our root? Who really are we? Who are we really? And why do we do the things that we do? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll happen as time goes on. I think a lot of people are looking back into their indigenous roots or their, you know, um, because it's kind of like um, the black culture. They, they lost their identity in a way, and then they had to go back and find it. And that's how it is with the native people too. And the, and the, the different groups that mixed in with that, they probably were told that they shouldn't talk about it, but now it's becoming a celebrated factor, right? In our history. Mm -hmm. Right. So I may be wrong in that because I'm, that's just my own idea of, of, of what I see, but the North is you know, you look at, there's natives everywhere up in Northern Ontario, but there's also a lot of French influence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you have those people, like I said, who have their, they know who they are, but they've become a new person again as well. Cool. Yeah. I, I know I have uh, a couple of friends who I met in the U S um, that were born some in Nigeria, some in Trinidad, you know, and but I met them in uh, the U.S., but they didn't come to the U.S. originally. They actually spent years in Canada, and so it's it's strange. Even though you're just our neighbor next door, um, as an American, it's it's we don't really think about oh wait, people do go to Canada, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like I know. like it's, it's like it's, for it's us, funny. it's like you guys yeah, are the attic, you know? Like <laughs> yeah, in order to get up up to where we are <laughs> some of them came up and they went back down and then they came back up and they went back down so yeah it's funny it's That's cool it's, i think again it's just one it's one spirit i think in many ways because when we meet somebody from canada or or united states or anywhere else we just we realize we're just we're just real you know we're just people and we have experiences and we have similar experiences mm -hmm. Indeed. So we don't look at the the cover anymore. I, I at least I don't. Yeah. Because I can love all nations and know that they have 
you know, the innate qualities that I have. We're all created, I believe we're all created beings by great design and that, you know, we all have those human fundamentals that make us, you know, connect to our planet and to each other, you know, and so that's how we could connect, you know, that's how we can find a common ground. Let's Mm -hmm. just say it, find a common ground because it's not all about where you're born. It's about where you are now. And I, and I like going back to the uh, um, Nikola Tesla. If we want to understand the mysteries of the universe, then think in terms of energy, yes. frequency, and structure. Frequency. And the, yeah, I mean, are and you on you, the positive or are you on the negative? Or where yeah. yeah um, exactly. Or even just like a, a high energy, low energy, you know, a similar energy, you know, or frequency. Yes. Like, are we, are we, working hand in hand or, or do we work better back to back or, yes. or do we not work together at all? But that doesn't mean we have to dislike each other. It just means that maybe, you know, we need to shift and someone needs to be between us. Right. Yes. Um, for us to function as a whole better. So when, when you look at life through those things, then it's like, well, what does skin color or gender yes. or all those kinds of things have anything to do with it anything? Has nothing to do with it. It's all about frequency. As you say, we're drawn to each other because we're on a similar frequency. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, so you're working on currently this thing for a charity project. Uh, we've spent a little time talking about where you've come from and the different paradigm shifts that have led you up to this point. Um, in five years, where would you ideally like to be with your art? Hmm. Well, honestly, I don't think about the future too much. I, I just, I'm in the moment. Okay. Um, because I don't, I think anytime I ever had plans for the future, things always went different than I thought they might. Cause I, I don't think you can see the future or even imagine it because, because of all the paradigm shifts you end up on and you, and you think you know something and you're walking along and then you realize, wow, there's a whole other direction you could take and it and you didn't know it existed before that moment and i think i'm at a per, i'm at another time in my life where uh, you know something's pulling me in that direction that i'm going in mm-hmm. um but i definitely want to explore as i mentioned more um uh, of the design qualities in a work mm-hmm. um i want to I want people to experience my work more deeply. I think what it is, is I want to experience the work more deeply. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what happens. And because yeah. you do, people feel that because you're, you're adding that into the work. Yes, because uh, it's my journey. Yep, that, that's yeah. what it is. Yep. Yeah. I had a, one, my first student, Bill, he once said to me, he said, you know, I painted my paintings before but this is the first time i ever knew them intimately Uh yes and um and i went out to new jersey to 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 visit him before uh, about a week or two before his show and he had all the paintings hung up and uh, as soon as i walked in i was walking up the stairs and there was one at the top of the stairs and i wept It, it was like um because we spent three months designing out these 13 paintings and, 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 and the approach that we do it in, it's like literally you can articulate why every line exists, why it's positioned where it's positioned, why it starts where it starts, ends where it ends, what diagonal it's in, why the values work the way every single value works the way it is. Like you know this thing intimately and then more importantly it's come out of you so it you didn't copy it from something else right that's right it it came from you and um and so when sergeant says you know you know something like when when i'm done with a painting and i and i give it you know to its owner or whatever it's like losing a friend or what or something along those lines like most artists know what that mean uh they know what that means but i would challenge them that if they would design to a greater capacity their art versus yes. relying on now I want to be careful when I say this when I say relying on references 
Mm -hmm. I think references are important, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of artists say they have references, but what they're really doing is just copying. And, um, and they haven't learned how to not copy because that's all they really know. That's what they've been trained to do is to copy, Yes. you know, draw what you see, you know, through mm -hmm. observation, measuring, measuring, measuring. And all they're really doing is transferring this three, this, this, subject that's in three dimensions to a two-dimensional surface yes. but without designing without composing well then you're just representing and yes, it's already existing <laughs> yeah yeah there's really you're not creating you know, anything yeah yeah and so um <clears throat> but when you do design now you're really engaging in the intentional work of connecting two souls yes you know, and well, it's experiencing yourself. It's, I think of it like this. Um, I think of God like that. I think God expresses himself through, through his creation because he's the life behind the creation. Yep. And without that creation, it would be, if there was no life in it. It would be dead. Essentially right. because we would know it's dead because it just, it just lacks that vibrancy or that aura or that, you know, you just somehow we innately know when something's dead and when something's alive. Even well, it's if simple. It if it has, dead. if it has no energy, no frequency or yes. vibration, it's dead. Yes. You know, in, in the, there's a book by Harold Speed called the practice in science of painting, I believe it is, or it might be the science and practice of drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a chapter in there where he says, you know, if you don't add rhythm to your work, it has no breath. It's dead. Yes. Yes. You know, and and so when when you're in art school and they teach you about repetition, they'll teach oftentimes it, it as a motif or a pattern or you know design in that sense, like it's a two dimensional graphic design approach. Mm -hmm. They don't teach you that. You know, a master artist, let's say we have 360 lines available. Obviously, we have more than that, but in a circle, we'll say 360 degrees. But a master artist will only use five to eight of those directions, right? Just like a palette, you have all these colors available, but they'll limit their palette, right? Mm -hmm. So by limiting your lines, you have to then rely on repetition, which then gives it beat and rhythm, and, and it resonates, it increases, it amplifies that math. So, you know, when, you're, when your eyes keep feeling this same exact diagonal repeated over and over again, it starts to breathe. Mm -hmm. When you just use random ones, well, now it's chaotic and it's disordered and we feel it. We sense it. And it just, it's just not jiving with us. Yes. <clears throat> and see, I don't understand that yet. Um, I think I approach things intuitively and I do know that there's an order, but I, I'm not exactly sure how to get it right every time. And yep. so I, I realized that an artist has to learn that representational part first. And I, I, I think every artist has to learn that, but then they have to step over if it's in them to express it just the way that they want to experience it, that they would push themselves a little farther because there's more to know. But I don't think we can grasp the fullness of it from an early point. I'm not sure about that. No. I, I, you know, like um, when you're looking at a picture of something, you don't automatically know why you like it so much. If it's, even though it's, you don't know it's done right well, well i agree with you on that that you yeah. need to know the language you need to know how to articulate yes. it um but you know i remember my daughter being four or five years old and us being at applebee's and having an inc like one of the most incredible design conversations mm -hmm. that like i couldn't even it was sad i couldn't even have that conversation with a with a 50 year old artist because yes. they just wouldn't they, they couldn't see that way. And she's yes. like, yeah, you know, dad, when I look at that, I see the triangles and the rectangle. And she's like, she's not drawing it, but what she's doing is she's sketching it out, but breaking it down. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and she had a couple tools in her vocabulary so we could have that conversation. Um, so I, I think representation is a, is a separate skill, just like representation yes, rendering. Me too. 
but design is a language that can be taught and it's really what visual literacy is. Yes. And so if, if you can get trained in it and you can do that at an early age, then, then you can begin to think through your art and yes. that's when it becomes very deliberate. And, yes. um, uh, and, and then it takes time because you have to know if you want to really get into the psychology of it. And I feel like you're, you're already here where you're, where you already developed a sensitivity to discern spirit, to, dur- to discern um, uh, intentionality of things. Um, and, and now if you can be, you know, add to that a skill set, which allows you to, and to intentionally and deliberately articulate through design those invisible qualities, because that's what design does. It's, it, it's the language that allows you to craft the invisible. Right. Representation and rendering is the skill set that allows you to focus on the image. Yes. Um, and I explain it this way. In the South, I don't know if you guys have, if you guys say this in, in Canada, but in the United States, we say it, and especially in the South, they'll say, oh, Sally is like the spitting image of her grandmother. Uh, have, you, have you ever heard of that yes. comment, spitting image? Well, wh- where it comes from, you know, spitting sounds like, you know, spit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but... True. But that's not where what the where it comes from. That's just a shortened version of the word spirit. And so, what the what they mean is that Sally, the little girl Sally, is in the spirit and image of her grandmother. And so, by by image, it's the physical things. Oh, she has her blue eyes, right? Or, uh, um, you know, she has curly hair like Grandma had, or whatever, right? But spirit, well her will, her attitude, the sway in which she walks, right? Yes. When she walks in a room, she brings a certain feeling that grandma always brought. Yes. All of those things are invisible. Exactly. The dynamics, you know, and, and that's the frequency, energy, vibration that we want to find in our subjects and then capture that. Yes. And, and the only way you can capture that is through design. There's no other way you can do that. And, and you capture that, that spirit and then you add on we call it context but if you want to do abstraction that's okay if you want to do you know a landscape or if you want to do high realism portrait those are all great you know and they all require different skill levels but without the design underneath you can you can do them all and you're portrait's going to feel like it's lifeless and your abstracts are going to feel chaotic, you know, without that order underneath it all. Right. Um, and, and, excuse me. I just went on a rant, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one though. <laughs> I was with you. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, and in, in my hope in, in doing these podcasts and teaching over the next couple decades, is to really encourage the abstract artists to go deeper Mm -hmm. because what they're tapping into is beautiful Mm -hmm. and they're pure soulists as i call it right like they're just wanting to focus on the energy the problem is is they don't have the language to do it right and then the people who want to go to the other extreme like hyper realist it's amazing their skill sets are incredible but if they could tap into design to actually yeah. blow life into their clay, mm-hmm. they can exactly. actually create a living being inside that canvas. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and that's what I want to experience. Now, if you were going to do that, what would you, let's say you have this power of design behind you and you're blowing life into your clay. What, would, what is your clay? Would it be landscapes? Would it be uh, I, still lives? Like, what brings you joy? Yeah, I think that's a, it's not defined. I, I realize it doesn't matter what you put it into as long as you express it. So you're, you're the other way around then. So your focus really is like a challenge to just be a life blower. Like to yeah, blow really, life into all really. kinds of things. Yeah, I mm. want them to, to go across all all subject matter and realizing that it's the same life behind the whole thing Mm. because 
what makes us say that there's more life in a tree than there is in a in a glass bowl right there's yeah. not. well there isn't it's just the energy that you're able to to draw out of it that mm -hmm. is that is uh, and invokes her the emotion right That's it. Yep. Yep. people experience it and i i realize that i think it's not things that are important it's what it means to a person it's it's how we bring that draw it out and i love the word drawn because when you look up drawing it mm -hmm. it's not paper on pencil a, a, a pencil on paper excuse me it's pulling it mm -hmm. pulling it through and bringing it out of one place that we can't see and in, into something that we can and yep. not only visually but spiritually yep speaking, yep right well, and so, so, yep. that's Go the on. difference that's the dynamic that's the I I don't want to be one that just says I'm a landscape painter, or I'm still life painter, or I'm a portraitist. I want to do it for whatever, whatever. I think it pulls me. I don't think I pull it. Interesting. Honestly, or maybe you're pulling both of each other because it's a dance. Yeah, because I did a, a painting recently that I didn't I didn't publish it out um, publicly because it's a friend. And uh, I don't know if you saw it because your friends on my Facebook, but it was with the Bible and the, and the cloth and the sword. And that one uh, bothered me because within my reference material, I did not have something that would um, flow very well together. So I had to think of complementaries and whatnot, but I also did that intuitively. I, I didn't know what I was doing with the background. I had mm -hmm. to make up... Uh, I wanted to, to be cloud-like, but I didn't have the confidence that I could do clouds. So I just, I was just throwing paint on there and I was using color because I was feeling that it was going to be um, very moody. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, it looked like a cloud, but it wasn't anything I thought really about how I was going to do that. Now, let me ask you this. What was, because everything you mentioned are all representations and therefore symbols, right? Right, that's right. And the problem with symbols is it requires for the viewer to know what the symbol means. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yes. So um, one of the things we, we stress is to be cosmopolitan in your art, meaning to versus Main Street. So Main Street requires, or let's say local. Right. So to be local means you have to know that the, the language of that tribe, you have to know what that that sore represents. You have to know what that sword you know, with the Bible represents. You have to know, you know, these things. Right. Mm. Yes. But if you can elevate it to something else, not changing the rep, the, the objects, right. but in the way you approach the art. So, for example, let me ask you, what does the sword represent? It represents the word of God. Okay. So that's a, 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 a comment that's very general and, mm -hmm. and you can't feel it, right? You can, you can think about it and you can see it, but you'll need to, to make that connection. You'll need to say, oh, the Bible is the word of God. The sword is the word of God. There's a connection there, which mm -hmm. then limits the, the amount of who could experience that image, right? That's so, true. So let's go further. Well, why would the writers use a sword to represent? And so what is the energy frequency or vibration or AKA the spirit mm -hmm. behind the sword? Like what is it that we're to, to experience or feel or sense when, when we imagine the sword as a word of, as the word of God? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a weapon. And okay. So you can use it. Mm -hmm. uh, as a form of protection. Mm -hmm. um, but also, yeah, I think it's uh, also a person with a sword has somewhat a uh, strong level of authority because they have the Ooh, sword. Now we're talking. Yes. Okay. And also the fact that the light came on the sword meant that the sword was the important part of the entire picture. Okay, perfect. So the focus was on the sword. So the focus is on the sword. So the sword gives two things, you said, protection and authority. Yes. Okay. Um, now, what's interesting, it also gives power. Well, yes, because right? it's a king's sword, <laughs> just to be specific. It is yeah. a king's sword. So in, in the Greek, 
you have two words called the exousia and the dunamis. And so the sword in a way is kind of both because if you hold the sword and someone sees it and you speak, you have authority, right? Hey, stop. You're going to stop, right? Right. If they, if they don't stop, then you can swing the sword and, and now it goes into a kinetic energy, which then becomes dunamis, like dynamite. It becomes like yeah. power, right? You, now yeah. you force that person to stop because you cut their legs off. Um, right. <laughs> or their head. <laughs> or their head. Um, and if they're running at you, well, then you've, you, you, you've transferred authority to power for protection. Yes. So when you, so what I want, want, by asking you these questions, what I'm forcing you to do is to move past the visual, past yes. the representation, past the symbolism, and go deeper into the energy of what that is. Yes. So now if we say, okay, if we want power and we want authority yes. and we want protection, now the question that I would ask you is, what line pattern in your image would trigger inside of the viewer the sense of authority. And so let me give you a couple examples and you tell me which one best fits there. Would a bunch of horizontals make you feel like there's authority there? Or would a bunch of diagonals or would a bunch of verticals make you feel a more sense of authority? Yeah, I would say the vertical. Um because it's standing up. That's it. Yeah. And this is why many paintings of kings and like you, if you're looking at a Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh painting of of a poor boy, he creates him in all these verticals. Why? To to make this 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 lowly poor boy radiate a sense of status and authority and respect and dignity. Right. Right. And the, the, painting the boy doesn't do that. But painting the boy and saturating him in a matrix of verticals broadcasts that. And that becomes this wonderful experience. Like I see this little poor boy and yet I feel a king in him, mm -hmm. right? Which then gives us insight into the, the mind, the heart, and the sensitivity of Van Gogh. Very different experience. So mm -hmm. a lot of portraits of kings are done in verticals, right? Because yes. they're trying to exude broadcast transmit into the psychology of the viewer that this is the moment of authority or the or the or the image of authority yeah. um so if we want power would we use verticals diagonals or horizontals well the first question you asked me was authority but if you want power power like well, this active dunamis power described where the sword is swinging it would be vertical to me okay so if it's vertical then it's still right because um, yeah, something fully true. horizontal and fully vertical are, are are locked into that one degree um so it wouldn't we would agree that it would not be horizontal if you want to convey power, correct? No, because that would be like it's lying down. Yeah, and that rest, it's calm, it's peaceful, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So now in an image like this, you may bring in a whole bunch of horizontals in the bottom of the image, right? So sure, you have a power and authority above, but it brings you down and ultimately to establish a sense of peace, right? Mm-hmm. And so, then the, uh, mm -hmm. the other factor was um, the the garment that was underneath the Bible mm -hmm. was and the sword was a mixed fabric of velvet, purple velvet, and and a gold satin. Okay. And the two cloths coming together represent um, the relationship between Christ and his and his word and his bride. Okay, so I think what I was seeing when I was doing it was that the garment was intertwined, but it was left on the floor. Mm -hmm. And so was the sword with the words. So mm -hmm. they had now moved on and transcend into a light, which was sort of coming through a cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an anointing there or an atmosphere that 
they left those things here and went beyond. So they, they were transfigured. And that was the thing on the Bible was, it was the transfiguration. Ah, okay. Very cool. Yes. Very cool. Yes. And the sword was right across that and the light was coming down, illuminated on the word, but they weren't there anymore. They were, they had become one. Absolutely. And moved on. So, into so when I, when I envision that design, right, <clears throat> I'm going to look past all the visuals and yes. say, in terms of a design, what I would want to see is this very strong vertical coming down. Mm -hmm. and coming into direct con uh, connection with a strong horizontal base, right? Because right. ultimately the horizontal gives you the stability, the rest, the calm, the rock, yes. right? Mm -hmm. But when you have this 90 degree angle, it also is the greatest, most, like the strongest angle you can have uh, relationship out of all the other angles because it's, it's, directly opposite right it's perpendicular to each other mm -hmm. and then what you could do is coming down from the verticals you could use a beautiful curve right that over over um like the, the, the kind of um what's the word i'm looking for covers the image right so now the eye feels the vertical when it's looking at the top of the image it feels this beautiful gentle curve mm -hmm. which now makes you feel you're protected or closed yes. or housed in mm -hmm. you have this solid base which makes you feel calm and safe and and peaceful at the bottom and then using the cloth the cloth really just cloaks this beautiful uh pattern of these these diagonals flowing through there right and so you have this beautiful curve transitioning into these diagonals and you have this beautiful vertical coming in boom turning into this horizontal and the juxtapositions of those energies will make you feel this transitioning from one to another from authority to peace from protection to power um and then if it's constantly moving it's it's just constantly moving you through this experience of this ever-ending transformation right mm -hmm. now you could put a bible in there you could put a sword in there you could put fabric in there and clouds in there if you want you have an an architecture that's underneath that ultimately becomes invisible but felt mm -hmm. or you can make it a tree with a with a with a lake mm -hmm. with a beautiful um curved uh clouds and, and mountain in the background or, or tree line coming down with maybe a path, right? Mm -hmm. Totally different context and representation. But the same feeling. But the same exact feeling. And yeah. so now you've just elevated and now God for one could be this representation symbolism, but they still feel it. Or they could say, wow, I could be out in nature and in the trees and the ground and the, the sky in his, in his creation. Yes. I still feel his authority and his yes. peace and his protection and his power, right? Yes. You could take that and make it into a, a picture of a mother f feeding her baby. Yes. You know, I mean, there's, it's this endless. Is why, this is why I don't want to pick a so much stick with one um, genre. I want to be able to express that feeling through anything that I choose. Yeah, I think in your heart, what I hear, and I meet a bunch of people like you, is that you really have the heart of a composer. Yeah. The problem is, is in art, visual art, mm -hmm. there's no place for you. <laughs> for, that's and, funny. and that's one of one of my challenges and goals yes. is in, with my life is to carve out a place for the composer because yes. in music you have people who compose and write music right mm -hmm. but they're not the performer yeah so you, that's you, true they're not the performer and yeah. they can then sell that design that composition to all kinds of artists who can go perform their 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 music in different genres mm -hmm. from country to rock to reggae to rap or whatever and and it changes it because of the way it's being performed but but the core of it the, the composition the thing that came out of the invisible someone else did mm -hmm. and, and you have that in all all kinds of art industries 
but in visual arts for some reason um maybe over the last hundred years or so um that doesn't exist anymore but it does with what you're doing uh, it, because you're doing the important work of uh, helping the artists understand the design factors so that they can have that behind their work so i think that you're you're more or less somehow i don't i don't understand why you know these things but you must have studied it or somehow discovered it but somehow you've seen these rhythms in nature and how that you know different objects standing in certain ways and how you design something bring pulls an emotion and if you put a painting on top of that design then you have that's exactly what you were just describing yeah. you have a composition you have somebody who's you've you knew that that is what that would do when before you painted it well go study you know the, the truth is it's, it's a bunch of combinations of things it's one of the combinations is when you analyze you know several hundreds uh se several hundred paintings in 20 years yeah. uh you start to really like see oh my gosh like it's all there right and it's it's there um the other factor is uh, i was raised in foster care and so being raised in foster care i lived in so many different homes and they all had a similar structure but very 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 different context right and some had stronger elements and some had weaker elements and so it was weird growing up it was like a curse to have you know uh, to always be removed from one home and put into another and then removed and put it. but somewhere along the lines i actually started to look at whoa what a blessing that i had because yes. i got to see where most people only get to see one version of this experience yes. i got to see 10 different versions of this That's experience great. right yeah and um and and so you know at 41 there's a blessing that comes from it there's also mm -hmm. some things that i still have to deal with that most people don't deal with you know mm -hmm. um I, I remember when i when my daughter came along i was so used to living in other people's homes that i did not know how to live in my own house right mm -hmm. and so uh, my wife said you know um she said to me she said you know she's your baby you can you don't have to ask to come into the room to to be with her right mm -hmm. and and it was a very weird weird thing you know but that's like it i was just so it used to living in yeah, yeah it, was, it was yeah exactly I, was, like, I didn't know what it was like to have my own family my own yeah. home you know so even though it was my family my own home mm -hmm. i was just trained to to observe right yes. um so in, in that and, and there's you know i spent 20 years um really just dedicated to try to understanding god life invisible things you know mm -hmm. metaphysics so you, you bring all that together and it's just this very interesting collection of uh insights that um yes. that then match to when you apply to the things that were written a hundred years or you know past for example da vinci says that the work of the master is to conceive ideas and to design them the actual execution is left to the lesser minds right mm -hmm. well that makes total sense <laughs> In the world where designers and composers, where you're being paid to design and compose, right? Right. Not to paint. Yes. It doesn't make sense in a world where the artist thinks, oh, I'm the executor, the painter. Yes. R right. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's kind of where my goal is to contribute to, to art history is to, is to help restore that, the composer's mindset. And, and really the focus and the importance of it. And, um, and, and, and in doing that, what's beautiful is there's people like you who I find, uh, and, and myself too. It's why I haven't, quote unquote, mastered a medium. Because to me, my joy has always been in the architecture of the piece, not the, the putting the construct contractor's hat and actually con you know, constructing the building, right? right? That's right. And there are some people who, 
just absolutely love the painting process, the finishing process, the constructing process, you know, that sense. But they have no idea where to really start with how do you make a blueprint, yes. you know. But before you make the blueprint, you have to sit down with the client and know what the client's desires are. That's the story that we talked about all the way from the beginning. So mm-hmm. it, it's okay if you know how to move an eye through a painting, but if you don't know wh- why, then what's the point exactly? Yes. So uh, Ruth, let me ask you, if you were sitting down talking to an artist, what advice would you give them? Hmm. I think a lot depends on who I'm talking to. Okay. Describe a type of artist that. <laughs> hmm. I find artists to be all different. Um, and I find that, you know, as, as the art goes, some are expressing, just expressing, some are, are, are being representational, doing portraits. Some are, mm-hmm. Some aren't worried too much or just having a good time and, mm. you know, thinking about, they're not thinking about what they're doing. So I wouldn't probably say much to them. Mm-hmm. They're just enjoying it. I wouldn't want to take that away from them in any way. Um, especially if they, they're excited about what they're doing because they're not ready for information at that point. They, you would hurt them if you tried to give them something they couldn't digest. Oh, great, great point. I was actually going to, change you in a different direction but i'm glad you said that so let's just go with that direction um uh man that's really powerful that you said that huh have you ever read a book called jonathan jonathan what is it jonathan livingston seagull no well if you do like reading it's a great book especially uh in the art of metaphysics Okay. Um, and, and it's really about tapping into a deeper level of spirituality, but mm-hmm. ultimately coming back to, uh, um, if you feel led to lead other people, that there's a great responsibility. Mm, um, so true. I got goosebumps everywhere. That's the <laughs> truth. Cause if you say the wrong thing yeah. at the wrong time, you could destroy a personality that, that my voice will speak to them for however long yep. until they can get over that. If I was wrong. Yep. And so I try to be sensitive to the spirit of a person and where they're at in their journey. If I feel that they're really searching and they're very interested in what I'm doing, then yes, I definitely drop, you know, a, a thought here or a thought there. It's kind of like how you approach things. Think on this, think on that. If mm-hmm. they can't go there with me, then I don't go any further. Yep. That's uh, but awesome. if I feel that they can, to walk a little while with me then i i show them the side of the world that i'm my perspective mm-hmm. right and how that i want to experience it and, and, and express it and and then go from there otherwise i just i try to encourage everybody and where they're going because that's their journey and they may then i may never cross roads with my journey as far as experiencing art the way that i do um mm-hmm. but i know that no matter what they're doing and in what state they're at, whether they're going to be a master or whether they're just having fun or, you know, uh, we'll always stay the same, never change. I've seen hundreds like that. Mm. Um, they're just enjoying themselves and that's, what's important. I, it's the energy that they they have. Yeah. So I never want to take anything away from them. And, uh, and if they want to learn, then I'm, I'm so happy to be able to share what I know. Um, so I think I do have the heart of a teacher in that respect, but I don't try to overstep my boundaries, especially if that person feels that they have something they know and they want to express their, you know, express their own view on that. I'm not, I don't want to get into a point where I'm like, well, I know that mm-hmm. so you don't, <laughs> you know, uh, because I don't understand everything. I'm only just experiencing it as it happens. And like I said, I, I may find that I don't know much at all and that I'm just about to find out, right? So I think I approach life with that anticipation and I hope people feel my energy. I feel, I feel that I share myself because I want people to wa- see that journey that 
it's it's a process it's you're never there you're it's you know like what you mentioned about how how much adversity that you face and how that you found that was one of the reasons why it kind of qualifies you to see things a lot better than somebody who may not have experienced something like that and my whole philosophy on on life is that the greatest things come out of adversity and trials build character Mm -hmm. and when we find that we're going through an awful time and we don't understand i think that's when you know i've i've experienced that i have to trust in a greater wisdom and know that i'm not the first one that's uh, had to experience that but know that it's going to build something in me that will strengthen me in in the long run so that i'm looking you know more holistically at it you know and then I say, oh, yeah, okay, I get that. Kind of how, like, when our calls didn't meet up today, I mm-hmm. go, okay, that's okay, because I may not be ready for that phone call, right? Mm-hmm. I might not be ready to say what needs to be said for me right at this point, you know, or express myself in that way. So then I don't even think about it. I have no regrets. I, I really believe that somehow, profoundly, we're experiencing this life not for the first time. I think that Hmm. it's being expressed at this point, but that it it all is going to happen just the way that it was meant to happen, you know? And so I find everything interesting for that reason. That's beautiful. I'm I'm in agreement with you on that. It's, it's a, it's a strange thing because you do, there's a part of being the ego wants to feel like, no, I'm in control. Yes. (laughs) And it's like, well, you, you're not in control of the that you were born. You're yeah. not in control of unless you kill yourself, right? right. Uh, as like, like your death, and there's just a lot of things you're you are in control of, and you're not. And and when you only look at your let's say eighty years of life, or ninety, or a hundred, or whatever it might be, um, it's very easy to feel that you are absolutely in control of everything. But when yes. you step back and you just look at it as just something as three, five, ten generations, and that you're just like, and that's small too. It's not a long amount of time. It's a couple hundred years, right? Yes. But um, when, you, when you step to look back at your life and you can envision maybe your children, your grandchildren, maybe even your great-grandchildren, then you go back, there are... And you start to see patterns forming. Yes. And, and you know, it's crazy. Like with, with me, I wasn't raised with my biological family. So when I went and I studied and I start to see these biological generational things occurring. Yes. And I wasn't raised with them. Mm-hmm. I just find it hilarious. Um, you know, so not hilarious. Your but your ancestors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And your it, children. And my and my and my children. So it's interesting. Um, I'll tell you two quick stories about that. Like one, three hundred years ago, and I've mentioned this story before. There was a guy, same last name uh, as my mom, who comes from <clears throat> this certain area in Spain, and and it's just funny. Like he was, his name was Don Felipe de Castro, and when brought in by the king to restore the art academy the royal art academy he said hey we got to focus on anatomy which is what we're talking about which i call representation and rendering right Mm -hmm. um and geometry right Mm -hmm. like the like composition design like if you want to be great these are the two things you have to focus on and 300 years later i'm running around and i started teaching this stuff and then i found out about him Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's kind of creepy, right? Like, <laughs> like, there's a message that goes through the earth and somebody picks it up. And sometimes you're lucky that it flows through, you know, your lineage or maybe out of a certain area, you know. Um, my, my brother, he's an international uh, renowned illusionist, magician. And strangely <laughs> enough <laughs> yeah exactly for, for, for what you do yeah exactly mm-hmm. and then strangely enough that same area of spain is where uh 
the idea of like what we think of witches with the black hats and the big noses and the cats and the broomsticks, like that comes out of that area of Spain, right? Now, not that my brother's in the black arts or anything, yeah. but uh, you know, but but still, it's the idea. It's that same mystical um, illusion type of uh, thing, right? And so, uh, you know, and then like one day I was uh, like a few weeks ago, I was talking to my son, and and he's he's you know he's going to be eight soon, and we were talking about him having a son, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what we started doing <clears throat> were these things called um, uh, Grandpa Solly, right? Grandpa Solly. Mm-hmm. And now he's only seven now and he loves to read. And so uh, I wasn't really good at reading and it was a fear of mine, but he loves to read. So that I saw that healed in my family line. And so I was like, how can we continue passing that on? that blessing on. And so what we decided to do was to make a challenge that he's going to read on video camera, 50 books, little kid books. And he'll say, here's grandpa Solly at seven years old, reading 50 books to his children and his great and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren. Right. Right. Like just being deliberate in designing that now. Yes. And, what came out of that conversation was he said, yeah, dad, like I, I would like to name my son Abraham. Right. Yeah. Or maybe, or maybe Lincoln. Right. Cause he was thinking Abraham Lincoln, not Abraham right. from the Bible. Right. And I said, wow, that would be cool. The co- you know, Link, Lincoln Vargas. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> we could do that. You <laughs> know, or eight. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, keep brainwashing him so he can name up my, gra- my grandson, Lincoln. It's all about influence. It is. And what's crazy is his name is Paul, right? Paul Solomon, okay. which happens to be Paul in Spanish is Pablo, which is my grandfather's last name. And his mom's grandfather's last name is Solomon. Mm-hmm. And name. yeah. And so my grandfather's name is Pablo or Paul. And his father's name is Libertion, which means liberty, freedom. Yes. Mm-hmm. And here my son, who's Pablo, right, mm-hmm. wants to have a kid and name him Lincoln, which because he set people free. And when you look back and you're like, whoa, that's one, two, Powerful. three, four, mm-hmm. five, six generations. And it's just created this loop. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, th- th- it was like, okay. We have control, and then we don't have control, right? It, it, <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. Every, all the influence factors in, though. It's it's very profound because when you really do real, when you realize it's by great design, then it can't. You know, it can't fail. It, it's going to express what it's what it's exactly. supposed to. It's going to have the effect that's necessary. And yeah. you know, and somebody may say, well you're brainwashing, you're controlling, whatever, right? But when we look back in terms of great design, Mm -hmm. cathedral building, from my understanding, like there's a cathedral that they put into plan and they knew it would take 300 years to finish the cathedral. Yes. Right? So to have the foresight to actually put into uh, motion the finances, the architecture, the generational um, commitments, that needed to be in place to actually see this thing come to fruition. Yes. Where even though a lot of them, from my understanding, these churches were, were built where the architect came into it knowing that they would die before it was fully constructed. And so part of their responsibility was not just to design it and, 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 and project manage it, but also at the same time, raise up a protege whose responsibility would to be f- to, to finish his master's work. Right. You know, like that kind of foresight planning and thinking is very, it seems very, very far from where we are today. Mm-hmm. But when you, when you start to live that way and think that way, mm-hmm. all of a sudden, like uh, you get an insight into life um, uh, that, that humbles you. And you realize there's, there's much, there is a great designer behind it all. 
Mm -hmm. That has an emotional connection with its work. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about my own children and we actually, we unschool our children. You homeschool them? We unschool them. Oh, you unschool them? We homeschooled them first. Mm -hmm. So we gave them the, the, we equipped them with um, the understanding of how to communicate Mm -hmm. and how to find information. And then we gave them the opportunity to follow their passion and uh, learn on their own, uh, based upon their own interests, just like what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, And to trust them, to know that they're, they're going to just they're going to develop the because we know that they already are who they are before they're even born as far as we're concerned we just get the blessing of watching this come to pass but one thing that we really believe in is mentorship we mm-hmm. believe that if you see a gift in your child you should pair them with somebody who understands that gift yep And so then you're taking that last generation and perhaps a generation before that who gave it to that person and you're giving it to that child who then will hopefully develop it and, and do pass it on in the same way that it's been given to them. And I think the wisdom that is we see now is that we've, we've made a mistake just by making everything so abstract in the learning um, with school and Mm -hmm. books and, without practical experience there's no it's like having a painting with no understanding of an experience of what it means right Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so by giving them the practical um you know then they can experience it firsthand and take it from that point so yes i i think there's so much value in that it's something we've lost but I think we're, we're finding it. We're realizing that computers, you know, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, Mm -hmm. the spirit of life is not going to be behind the work. It's going to be very, you know, it's just duplication is what it is. There's there's nothing you can love about it because there's just no love in it, (laughs) you know? So the artists are coming out stronger in every medium so every ven what uh, what can i say like every profession so every trades person every person who has to design what they make there there comes another element that will attract people because it's a i think it's a real person behind the work or a spirit behind the work or reason behind the work mm-hmm. i don't know how you want to put it mm-hmm. um that will make it more valuable in every way to the person who appreciates it and will buy it you know, so I find now that everybody's lost jobs with, uh, you know, the career choices they made. Technology has changed. Mm-hmm. I'm just seeing so many artists come out and express themselves in different ways. And I think, wow, it's like the world's turning into a whole bunch of artists, you know, that are creating in their history. And, you know, they're just, I don't know, it just makes it so much more beautiful than it than it was and then there's that other side of it. Well, yes, we need that. We need that structure. We need, you know, we need our intel, our computers and these sorts of things, but only as vehicles to get us to, to truly express what, what we want. Indeed. It's, it's basically like if you rely on the calculator to give you the answer, then you grow stupid Yes. Um, or the spell checker or whatever. But if you develop those the ability to do the math and the writing and then you use those tools to enhance or yes. to bring clarity or to just um, proofread or whatever to double check then then those tools become um, assets right not not crutches yes. and so I, right. I agree with you I love the idea of the mentoring um, I had a friend who like I told you, I didn't like reading. I wasn't very good at it. And so she called me up and she says, oh my gosh, I read a book called The Power of One. Do me a favor, please read it. And so I committed to her that I would read it. And so I went out and I picked up the book Power of One and realized it was 10 and a half inches thick. Oh my God. And then, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I was like, what the heck did I do? <laughs> it wasn't 10 and a half in, but it was a thick book. I was like, ah, I'm, you know, like reading a kid's book is too thick for me. Right? So, 
<laughs> and so I was like, all right, I'm doing this for you, Natalie. But going through that process, I walked out on the other end realizing that if I had the ideal situation, that mentorship, apprenticeship is the way that I would want to train my children. Yes. Um, and I always envisioned it didn't work out this way. Um, I, didn't, I didn't grab the bull by the horns and make it happen. Um, and I regret that. Uh, but the, I, I always wished like I had, you know, that retired math teacher who always wanted to tr really teach math and he was passionate about it or she was, but because of the system, mm -hmm. it kind of held them back and they kind of got beaten up and, and, and to give them that last opportunity just to download who they are mm -hmm. as a math, math person into my children or yeah. a music person or whatever, and just create that atmosphere. And, some people may be listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, you people are irresponsible. Who, who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. But if I'm correcting the word, I think they're called eludes. I may be mispronouncing that. But from my understanding, in, in Roman times, the Roman elite would go in and find Greek slaves that they had and bring them in to become, I believe the word was eludes, like eludes to their children, which were basically these private mentor teachers, kind of like, um, I believe it was Aristotle was to Socrates, right? Right. And their job was to build a relationship with the child and teach and train and, um, and become that older uh, uh, person. Mm -hmm. it, in our Native American tribes, you know, the, the mom and the dad, the, the young adults would go out and hunt and run, the, run the, uh, the society. But the older people, their responsibility was to educate the children, right? Mm -hmm. And pass on that wisdom. And, yes, uh, wisdom is a good word to use. Yeah, yeah that, you know, and so w there's a lot of, like Einstein said, don't let schooling get in the way of your education. And I think. Yes, exactly right. And it's, you know, it's important. It's important to have both, I think. Indeed, indeed. Um, like our boys, they'll, they can search anything on the internet. Mm -hmm. And they can learn a lot. And they have books they can learn from. I, I make sure that they have a, a large palette of opportunity to mm. pull from. But when, there's nothing like a human being. Yeah. And although that... You know, save my son. He wants to, uh, he, he likes uh, the idea of smithing, blacksmithing, um, working with metals and whatnot. And cool. the neighbor we have, he's a very wise old farmer that grew up, you know, simply not a, very educated at all. Uh, but he understands the fundamentals of welding and, you know, working with metal and stuff. Um, and so, uh, what happened, what I noticed happened was when they went up to the blacksmith shop to look at, oh, what do we have here, right? We have a, we have a forge, we have tools, you know, um, the farmer was, friend was saying, well, why don't you do this? And my son said, yes, but I realize there's a reason for that. Like he said, shorten a handle or something like that. I can chop that off for you. But my son went back to his book and he said, there's a reason why it's long like that. And um, so he's not depending completely on that mentor, but he mm -hmm. is going to enhance him, you know, mm -hmm. his experience by listening to what he has to say, not to try to change the way the farmer thinks, mm -hmm. but just to take what he knows already from his studies and when he goes to do it so that he can take and sift the information, um, do what the guy says when he's with him, but also not to be afraid to, to you know be an individual with it and to do it the way that he wants to right not in the sense that you have to do it this way no i don't believe that's ever the right way to go i think you have to do it the way you want to and you'll learn from your mistakes if you do it wrong or you may find out something that's really neat that the person before you maybe didn't didn't experience in the same way so and that being said I look back at the old artists, the, the masters, mm -hmm. the next, um, the next generation of artists learned from the masters. They, they did so all they did of the front word, you know, so they understood the spirit of why and how and, and, you know, so that they could reproduce 
something similar, but in their own way, mm -hmm. right? So it continued on that knowledge until we got to more of a schooling. This is the way this is not. And I heard so many people say they went to art school and they didn't learn a whole lot about yep. doing art. They but just I imagine got a receipt. <laughs> yeah, so I imagine they must have learned a lot about art history and why art and, you know, that sort of thing, but... Not really. No? See, I never um, experienced it, so I can't say. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's... Uh, I, like, there's a, a, a school up here. I was reading an article on called RISD, and one of my students went there when she graduated years ago. She was, like, considered the best in her graduating class, right? And... um and she constantly like i have to kind of like work with her not to get upset <laughs> yeah. um because she thinks she knows uh, because she did well no 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 oh, okay. she, not get upset with with her schooling because she did do well according to their standards and yet like almost nothing i teach her was taught there right, right. so and for her what i'm teaching her is so valuable that it just blows her mind that you would pay forty, sixty thousand dollars a year, you know, almost a quarter of a million dollars in a four year education and not learn these fundamentals. Yes. Right. And, and a lot of times these, especially uh, our colleges, they look for talented people so that they can then use them in their marketing. And yes. then they just pat them on the head and say, you know, you, you, you go try do, do what you want to do, you know, we're, we'll support you, you know. Yeah, they make them look good, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I had a, a friend who studied where I studied when I was younger, and he went off to RISD, not RISD, uh, yeah, it was actually RISD. Um, and within the first week there, they just realized, they came to him and said, uh, we can't teach you anything, but do you mind if we use your drawings in our marketing? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so they made these big posters and like, look what we, what you can learn yes. here, you know? And it was just like, uh. oh. so it, I hear a lot of people get very upset. And the sad thing is you could spend a quarter of a million dollars on an education and over 90% of art students within three years after graduating are no longer in the art industry. Right. You know, because it's just, they don't teach you how to make a living at it. No. And they're not teaching you the right skill sets. Right. Or don't you think that it may be something that, well, I mean, I always thought if you're an artist, it's part of your psychology. It's part of your personality. It's, you're, you're, a, I guess, some would say you're a liberal or you're, you know, you have a way of thinking that lets you be an artist. So you are always an artist, even from a child. You have that way of taking something disorganized and channeling it to make it what you want, what you want. Whereas other kids, other people just know we don't have a desire to do anything like that. They don't like an art at all. So don't you have to ha be an artist before, you know? Uh, I think like, like anything, um, I like how the Greeks tell this story. Um, they tell a story about Eros, which is the god of passion. He's Cupid, right? Okay. And I guess he hits himself with an arrow, and he sees this girl, and her name is Psyche. And so he falls in love with Psyche, and he runs after Psyche, pursues Psyche, but she keeps running away. She wants nothing to do with this crazy, passionate, on-fire lover. Um, and uh, so she keeps running. But at some point, she gives in. And they decide to get married. But because he's a god, he can't marry. Let's call him, because he's a divine element, he cannot marry this earthly element, right? Okay. And so they go to this other god who transforms her psyche into a demigod, which is kind of like this half between god and, and human. Right. And so they get married. And then they have this child, and I forget the name of the kid, but the translation of the name is delight. Okay. And so I always use that story to explain that, yes, you have to have the passion, right? Yes. The passion, you cannot be trained to have the passion. Right. You can be given the opportunity to foster those things and to make those connections. Um, and I believe as a parent, you can actually 
put certain things into effect that will 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 increase the likelihood of that passion forming um but ultimately yes i agree you have to have the aptitude and the passion now from there you pursue psyche Mm -hmm. you pursue knowledge to the point that there comes a point where that passion and that knowledge merge and they're they're, they get married and usually it's after you put your ten thousand hours in that yes. the knowledge, the skill sets elevates to a point of wisdom, which is just this intimacy with this knowledge. Mm-hmm. And, and out of that combination of passion and wisdom births this, this experience, this delightfulness. Right. And so I think going to school, going to um, college, things like that, it's supposed to be a point in your life where you have a space to just experiment, run after, acquire knowledge, network with people, can make connections. You know, mm-hmm. it's a great time to a great place to pour that passion in and and find things out. Right. Um, but I I just I think the problem is is that most people go to these institutions not knowing who they are already yes and so they spend three four years partying playing and then and then trying to figure who they are yes and the people who go there who say i am an artist now i'm going to go take advantage of this great situation those people just you know they blow up right um Mm -hmm. and and so it's that's why I like these smaller studios that are coming out, like these ateliers and things, because at least you go in, you pay a premium uh, price for the experience, you come out and you have skills, yes. major skills. Mm-hmm. My only concern with them is I haven't found one that teaches design properly. Right. Right. So, Um, that's where I see the next evolution coming Mm -hmm. is taking those incredible skills, mixing it with, um, this, this, uh, design skill set and storytelling skill set. And I think the combination of this will give artists what they're looking for, which is, uh, this incredible ability to express themselves in, in an incredibly, in an incredible way at a high level of craftsmanship. Yes. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming out now is, is really cool, but I'm excited for like my daughter's generation, yeah. my son's generation in 20 years to, to come into that fold. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I know you mix that with technology. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Where are we working it out? You know, we can't imagine what it's going to be like. And you train them also to be good business people too, right? Like, because ultimately they got to feed a family and themselves and things like that. So if you can teach them how to be sensitive to themselves and others and self-aware, give them an incredible skill set at a high standard of craftsmanship and the ability to be aware of how to deliver value to a marketplace in exchange in trade for cash or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I call it personality portfolio and profit like if you can focus on those three things then you're gonna uh, i think we'll have an incredible movement of art again very and i powerful. think that the three become become one and just that i always said that well when when the work is is valuable then it will it will sell i mean you will benefit from it in some way so I think that until that time ha- comes, then you're just, you're on that journey of portfolio. <laughs> First you have yeah. personality, then portfolio, and then you make money from it. Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. can have a portfolio and have a horrible personality, right? Yeah. And, and having a horrible personality, let me explain what that means. That does not mean necessarily that you're a, a mean, grumpy person. It could mean that you're a very nice, cheerful person, but you're just totally self, uh, you're just unaw- self unaware. Yeah. Like you just have no idea who you are, really, what's truly going on in the psychology of yourself or people. 
um, you might be, you know, you, you might be friendly and you might have a great portfolio because you're really, really good at not only copying what you see, but also copying all the expectations of other people and not knowing yourself. Yes, that's true. You know, so the money will come, but we're still working on personality with a yeah. lot of people. Skill originality, sets, right? Originality, exactly. Because yeah. at the end of the day, your secret sauce is your story. Yes. You know? That's, that's what, it, what Instagram that's what, is all about, right? That's what social media is all about. That's why we do it. Her story, yep. Yeah, it's our story. So, so let me ask you one last question before we can, uh, ask you for how people connect with you. In terms of story, if you were going to tell, <clears throat> you were going to sit down at a big long table and you were going to engage in a wonderful, wonderful story about art and life, I'm kind of curious, what would everybody be eating at this table? That would be your favorite food to eat. Hmm. Is that a hmm or a yum? What would everybody be eating? Maybe ice cream? Oh, shoot. It would be an ice cream party? <laughs> yeah, because they'd all be so feeling so good while they were listening. So that would help me. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love like that. <laughs> so, w w it, do you love ice cream? Oh, I do love ice cream. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but it's one of my, it's one of my, my, what do you say, necessary evils in my life. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you need to go get an apprenticeship with an ice cream maker. <laughs> <laughs> no that's my secret sin that is oh. <laughs> i try to be holistic and clean and you know pursue everything pure but ice cream kind of doesn't fall in that category so it's the it's the what do you say it's the thing you go to when the rest isn't working gotcha <laughs> yeah it's like the drug of choice i guess you could say <laughs> i feel you i feel you on that one <laughs> uh, sometimes I'm like, oh man, I, I achieved something great today or whatever it might be. Um, if I'm, if I'm on a high or sometimes if I'm feeling low, I'm just like, eh, I could go to Turkey Hill and get a little pint of ice cream. I, I, I really could. <laughs> ice cream can fix everything that way. Seems yeah. that way. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's your, what's your favorite, uh, kind of ice cream? Oh, that's a hard one. I don't think I can say what my favorite is. I think it depends on my mood. Mm. Really, I'm very complicated, I guess. Okay. You sound like a woman to me, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe that's what it is, too. Sometimes you need chocolate and sometimes you want something fresh with, you know, strawberries. I don't know. I don't, I don't stick with one thing all the time. I, I see something new and I'm like, oh, what is that going to taste like? You know, I want to experience that. So let's try this one. And then if that doesn't work, you go back to the tried and true, which you, if you, that's what you need in that moment, you know, something like heavenly hash is going to work really well. Heavenly hash? Yes, because it has so many different things in it. That what is that, like uh, ice cream with marijuana or something? <laughs> it may as well be. <laughs> you mean you don't have heavenly hash? <laughs> no, I've never heard of this. <laughs> it's a mixture of chocolate and marshmallow and you know i can't even say what it is all i know is that every bite you get you get a mixture of something different that huh interesting sort of texture to to it that's like oh yeah i like that you know it might have some cherries or you know some nuts or whatever it is but it's all stirred up together and and then it's yeah it's good i like it that's awesome awesome yeah. <laughs> well as you're enjoying and everybody else is enjoying their heavenly hash at, at this, at this long table, um, how can other people get connected with you if they want to go check out your artwork or just hook up with you? Um, well, I always tell people that if you, you did Google my name, there would be lots of things that will pop up. Like, um, I, ha I am on social media, so imagine Facebook and Instagram would pop up, but maybe Fine Art America would pop up. So 
Um, you can reach me through all those places, um, through my email, um, through those sites. So it's pretty easy, I think, to get a hold of me. Awesome. Yeah. And then I'll put that in the show notes and uh, so people can just click on and, and go over to your website then and, and connect yeah. with you. If they Google artist Ruth Wallace, I think, I think I'd tag most things with that. Mm. Ruth Wallace. Yeah. I like the sound of that. <laughs> thank you. Well, Ruth Wallace and your heavenly hash. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on the show and we had a great conversation. It was my pleasure. Me too. In just 30 days, the Core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven-day, no-hassle, money-back guarantee at core80.com.